morning. Hello everybody, it's very lovely to see you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, well, I hope everybody slept well. I hope everybody won the battle with the shower better than I did this morning. Because um, I've managed to have freezing cold shower two mornings and everybody else seems to have got the hang of it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's very lovely to see everybody. And yesterday it was... It was really good, wasn't it, to meet together and spend time reflecting on God's greatness and just how big and strong he is and so that we can let go of control and let him be in control and to think about God's glory and just, again, how glorious and powerful and how, how everything he is so we don't need to be fearful of people and I hope everybody's had a bit of chance to think about how that affects you in your lives. I, I know I have. And, and even this morning, thinking about standing up here, I was, I was uh, very encouraged to know that God's in control and it's nothing to do with me. So we're going to, um, we're going to sing our, our first song, which as we reflect on God's greatness and God's glory... I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the Pity angels beheld him 
And, yeah, how marvellous, how wonderful is my Saviour's love for me. Isn't it amazing to be able to sing that? Um, and uh, so would you like to just close your eyes and we will pray for this morning. So, Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for bringing us all here together. We thank you for our church family. Uh, we thank you for the blessing of everybody who's here. And Lord, I do just pray that you will help us um, if we're tired, if we've got other things on our mind, to just be here and be in your presence and to let you speak into our hearts today. And Lord, we do pray for the children, uh, meeting in the children's groups and the creche. We pray that you will be with the leaders and be with those young people and be working in their hearts to grow them to be men and women after your own heart too. And we lift up our brothers and sisters back home at St. Simon's. We'll be meeting in about an hour's time. And um, for David Towler leading that service and preaching, and for everybody who'll be there, that they will feel part of the family with us too, and part of your family. So, Lord, just uh, go before us into today and everything you want to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right, I'm going to try something now and see, see what you say. So I'm going to say, God is good. All the time. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a call and response that gets used a lot in Sierra Leone, as some of you know, and I think in some other countries as well. And it always moves me how the people responding to this have such massive, massive challenges in their lives. People who maybe don't get to eat a meal every day and people who've lost so many family members and things like that, that they say that with such joy and such confidence. And I think it's a really big challenge to me to think, do I truly deeply believe that God is absolutely good and I can trust his goodness is enough in every situation to look to him and not to put my hope in anything else? I think that's one of the challenges for us today. And so we're going to sing... Again, 10,000 reasons.
with you. Um, Our reading is taken from John chapter 4 verse 7 to 29 and I'm going to invite Sue to come up and read for us. Thank you. Oops. Oh well. Um, Yeah so the gospel of John Chapter 4, starting at verse 7 to 29. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, So, Frank's going to come and uh, share the word with us now, but I'll just pray for him first. So, Heavenly Father... Uh, We thank you for your word, that it is living and active and uh, changes our hearts and our lives. And we pray for Frank now, as he comes to speak to us, that uh, you will give him all the words that you want him to say and give us hearts and minds that are open to taking those words. In Jesus' name, amen. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Just before um, I get on to today's theme, a couple of things to say. One is there was a really good question yesterday about Matthew 10, 28. How do we know that that's talking um, about 
God rather than the devil, and I completely forgot the, the work that I'd done on that when I was preparing, so I went away and had a look at it. Um, I think one of the things that convinced me is James chapter 4, verse 12, which uses very similar language and is definitely talking about God as the, uh, as, as the one who has the power to, um, to save and destroy. You've got the same language in James. You often find that letter of James has got lots of the same words and ideas from Matthew, uh, and my guess is that James is in the crowd when Jesus is saying a lot of these things and hearing it firsthand and then putting that into his letter um, not so long afterwards. So it seems like it's a way that other parts of the Bible talk about God to describe him with those sorts of words. But also when you think about it, would, would Jesus tell us to fear the, the devil? You don't see that elsewhere in the Bible. We're told to resist him, to stand firm against him. We're not told to fear him. But we are quite often told to fear the Lord. Uh, and I think that people get uncomfortable with that, really. Should we fear God? You know, that's a bit of a troubling thought at first. But we have to remember that the God who, who loves us and saves us and adopts us into his family, he is a loving father. We do have a close relationship with him and our sins are dealt with. But we have to remember that God is still an awesome, terrifying, powerful God. And uh, the, the thought of turning away from him and rejecting him is something we should be, uh, should be a scary thought. Uh, we turn back to him and then we know we've got his love and we're safe. So uh, that was one thing um, that I wanted to mention. The other thing is that there's a, a book stall um, just at the back, a few books um, that tie in really well with the talks. Not everyone's a kind of book sort of person, but if you find it helpful to read Christian books, there's some there that would help you to... You know, I hear something this weekend and think, well, that sounds like me, and that's something I want to work on um, and pray about and think about a bit more and ask God to help me change. And, and working through it from a book might really help you with that. There's one about worry, for example, which is very good. And this one, Battles Christian Face by Vaughan Roberts, tackles a whole load of issues, more than I'll have time to mention today. Uh, image, lust, guilt, doubt, depression, pride, homosexuality, keeping spiritually fresh. Um, so that you know, there's a chapter in there on lots of things that might be helpful. This one I like, How People Change, Timothy Lane, Paul Tripp. Picture of a tree on the front. Um, and that's because the writer is really saying, there's, in the Christian life, there's the stuff you see above the surface. There's the tree. There's the fruit on the tree. Um, there's behavior. There's feelings. And often we focus on changing that. And really, if that's going to change in a big way, you have to go down to the roots of the tree um, below the surface, what is it that we really believe, what is it that we really love, um, and, and that's where the change needs to happen, and, and this book helps with that. Great. What we're thinking about today, uh, well, I'm going to start by um, telling you the, a little bit of the story of Leo Tolstoy. He wrote the story of his life, uh, and his long story for, um, that's a picture of him, there he is. Uh, you might have heard of him, long search for meaning in life, for fulfillment, that he went on, he rejected Christianity as a young person, went to university, thought that he'd be able to find something better, studied science and philosophy, but at the end of it said, look, this really hasn't given me the answers, it hasn't given, explained, it hasn't given me meaning. So he went to the university, he thought, let's, try, let's forget understanding the world, let's just try and um, enjoy it, let's just live for pleasure. And he got into drinking and sleeping around and gambling. But that didn't satisfy him, and it didn't make him content. So he turned instead to trying to be successful and try to achieve something in his life. And he did really well at that. He wrote some of the greatest and most famous um, novels that have ever been written, things like War and Peace and uh, Anna Karenina, lots of other famous books. Um, still a famous name today. Um, that didn't do it for him. He got married. He had 13 children, so I imagine that must have distracted him from a, for at least a while from the... Uh, from the search for meaning and fulfillment that he was on. Uh, but even after all of that, he still found himself close to suicide, saying that his long search through life had not got him anywhere. And in the end, he found what he was looking for in the simple faith of the, the poor people who worked on the land in the estate in Russia where he lived. Uh, and their simple faith in Jesus Christ, he said, that's the place where you find the meaning and the contentment that people are looking for. Um, there's a 4th century African bishop who's called Augustine, who wrote lots of Christian books. Um, and he put it like this, You've made us for yourself, Lord. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. You've made us for yourself, Lord. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Our hearts are made by God, 
And what we're really looking for, even though often we don't know it, what we're really looking for in life is that relationship with God uh, and to enjoy God and to, to discover that God is good. And that's the, me, that's the, the big, big idea that we're looking at this morning. We've, we've seen already, um, we've got four things we're thinking about this weekend. God is great, God is glorious, God is good, God is gracious. We're on the third one. God is good. God is good so we don't have to look elsewhere. So let's just dwell on that thought for the moment, that God is good. The Christian life is not dreary abstinence, going without, the bad life, the sad life, missing out on all the fun and the excitement that other people have. It's about being spared all all the heartache and and sadness and, and misery that other people are getting sucked into, that we've been sucked into, and instead enjoying the the good life enjoying God and and enjoying all that he gives us in this life and the next and the Bible says Psalm 34 verse 8 taste and see that the Lord is good taste and see that the Lord is good the writer of that of that song that poem is saying to us come and experience God come and discover for yourself come and try him out it's like uh, having delicious food in front of you uh, and a, a wonderful meal, a, a banquet, maybe a, a wedding banquet or something like that. Come and have a taste. Come and see just how good this is. You won't believe it. Isaiah uses the same kind of ideas and language that knowing God is like an amazing feast, the best possible treat. Um, so Isaiah 55 verse 2, uh, why spend money? I'm just going to move a bit closer actually. Um, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of, of fare. Isaiah saying we, we put a lot of effort into things that won't satisfy us. A lot of money and labor and work and effort, but it's not real bread. It won't really feed our souls. It won't give us what we're looking for. Instead, what we need to do is is come to me, Isaiah 55, verse 1, listen to me, talking about God saying, inviting us to come and and enjoy him, delight in the richest affair, our relationship with God. Um, And the the, the Bible reading that we had, if you you closed it, you might want to open it again, John chapter 4, the story of the Samaritan woman, um, helps us to understand that. So Jesus starts a conversation, he's been on a long journey, Um, it's a hot country, it's noon, it's the middle of the day, sun at the top of the sky, um, and he's arrived at a well, and there's there's a woman there getting water from the well. The most sort of obvious question to ask at a time like that is, can I have some some water? And a perfectly normal conversation to have. Of course, he's thirsty. But then Jesus turns this into an opportunity to to make a deeper point with the woman that he's talking to at the well. Um, and, and what he's saying is he's saying that water is like a picture of the thirst that we have in life. And, and that he is the one who can quench that thirst and really satisfy those longings. So um, he asked for water and then he says, well, look, if you knew who I am, if you knew who I really am, actually, really, you should be asking me for water. But of course, he means a different kind of water. John chapter 4, verse 10 Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You've nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Um, She's thinking like fresh water, living water, tap water. She's thinking like, where's the tap? Um, She's still thinking about water as in H2O, but he is talking about water as a picture of something much deeper and more important. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. That's our problem in life. We look for satisfaction. We look for fulfillment, for contentment. We're searching for something. We're thirsty for something. But whenever we find something, it doesn't doesn't really work. And so we just find ourselves wanting more. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Later on, John chapter 7, Jesus says this, that he's talking about the Holy Spirit, that, the, that 
not only does God, God know us, but he, he comes into our hearts and into our lives by his Spirit. And, and that wells up from within us. That's a kind of intimacy and a completeness and a, and a wholeness that can't come in any other way. God actually in us and in our lives and in our, in our hearts. And it's not something that, that we have for a while and then it runs out. Uh, it, it's a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This is quenching that thirst for fulfillment in a way that lasts forever, this life uh, and the next. So give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Bit of a shock, slightly out of the blue. But it seems that Jesus knows her heart and her life and knows this search that she's been on to find fulfillment. Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Well, that must have been really shocking for her to hear. It turns out, not only has she been coming to this well every day, filling it up her water jar with water, and then having to carry, carry it back again. I mean, it's hard work, isn't it? Very easy for us. Just turn the tap on. Much easier. She has to do that... Uh, and then the next day, it's gone. All the water's gone. She's got to do it all over again. Every single day. And it's, that's her life. Constantly trying to find that fulfillment. And the moment she thinks she got, she's got it, she's gone. She's on man number six now. And I, I mean, I guess anyone, when they, when they marry, they think, well, this is... You don't marry someone unless you're thinking, oh, this is the one. This is what I've been looking for. This is going to last. But then it didn't. So she tried again, and it didn't. So she tried again, and it didn't. So she tried again, and it didn't. And that's the story of her life, like that, bringing that, that water jar day by day. And Jesus says, I can give you something better than that. I can give you something lasting. I can give you a relationship that won't go bad and fulfill that thirst that you've got. Verse 28, chapter 4, verse 28. Uh, she realizes who she's talking to. She thinks, oh, it must be the Messiah. She's very excited about this. She goes and tells other people about it. Um, verse 28, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And I just love that little detail in verse 28. Then leaving her water jar. You know, that, that, that long life of trying to fill it up again and again every day and now she can leave it behind her search is over she's not hunting anymore for something that will give her fulfillment and meaning she's she's found it she's found jesus she's found the messiah well god is good god is the one that we've searched for that we're looking for in our lives god is good and because of that there's no need to look elsewhere God is good, so there's no need to look elsewhere. When we're tempted to do wrong in our lives, when we're tempted to do something sinful, it is because we believe a lie. In that moment of that, that we fall into temptation, it is because we think that that thing that we're drawn to, that temptation that we're giving into, we think that is going to give us more, offer us more, than, than sticking with God and his ways. We've been fooled, we've been tricked into thinking that's a, a good thing and better than God. Um, I used to do, uh, illustrate this with um, a kid's talk that I did um, where I would, I would kind of present the kids with a, a tasty-looking chocolate cake kind of covered in decorations. Um, I, I, I can't do any of that stuff myself, so I always have to rope in Catherine to make it look nice. Uh, and say, doesn't that look amazing? You know, hands up kids who'd like a piece. I'd say, this is really exciting, isn't it? And then I cut a slice into the piece, but actually what I'd ask Catherine to do was have a bit of cake around the outside and have some dog food on the, in the middle, you know, like not the kind of little crunchy dog food, but the nice the sort of really smelly, pungent uh, tin dog food. And the moment you cut in the slice and you smell that and the kids are immediately repulsed and they don't want to go near it anymore. And, and the point is that is what uh, temptation is in our lives. We're being lied to, being told this is delicious, this is tasty, and maybe when you first smell it and you first taste it perhaps... It is, but you get into it and you discover it's really a terrible thing. And God is so much better. God is, God is good. 
So Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus tells a very brief story. Have I put that here? Um, he says that Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. And I just want you to notice those three little words, in his joy. Here is a man who is, is selling everything he had previously and losing everything in order to gain the kingdom of God. And he does it joyfully. He's excited, he's thrilled to do it because he's realized that the kingdom of God is so much better than all that other rubbish that's been holding him down. And it's just such a relief to kind of throw it off and say, wow, I've got what I need now. It's not like in his reluctance, it's not like grudging, oh, it's so miserable, you know, being a Christian, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, all these rules to follow, uh, you know, a part of me still wants to be a non-Christian, I can just do whatever I fancy. Uh, no, it's in his joy. What a relief to be free of that way of life. And what a wonderful thing to have God, to have the kingdom of God, to belong to that. And that's what we need. If we're really going to change, and if we're really going to break some of those old uh, habits and patterns of, of wrong behavior, um, we are going to need that joy. We are going to need a new love for God that drives out the old desires for sin. Um, I made a very bad decision couple of years ago and and caved in and let our family buy a small dog uh she's called nelly she's a nightmare she causes so much bother so much trouble uh one of the things she loves to do is to grab things she's not meant to grab um you know so, so some guest will come to the house and not realize that you can't just kind of leave your shoes somewhere uh and then i'll see them through the window kind of chasing the dog around as the dog is running around with the shoe and they're desperately trying to get the shoe back off the dog uh, or she'll just, like, someone will not shut the bin properly and she'll get all sorts of disgusting stuff out of the bin. She'll be running around with that and leaving it in interesting places. Um, not so long ago, we took her on a walk around a country park. Uh, and unfortunately, it's a place where, where horses go uh, and leave little deposits behind. Um, I'll let you imagine the rest of that story. It's a pretty unpleasant uh, occasion. But we really wanted to know, how do you get the dog to let go of stuff? You know, I mean, how do you get her to drop stuff? You, 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 she's got a shoe and you grab it, she's just going to hold it tight and thinks this is a great game, tug of war. How do we actually get her to let go? So we thought, we're going to have to go to some proper training. We should have done this in the, in the first place. Yeah, and this trainer uh, at this session sort of explained how you do it. What you do is you, you have these really tasty, delicious treats that the dog would much rather have. Uh, and the dog gets in the habit of coming to you for these treats. Whenever you, you kind of shout for the thing that you shout and you hold it and the way that you hold it, uh, immediately... The, the, the shoe is dropped and the dog runs over and gets the treat because what you're offering is so much better. There's actually a training uh, guide that you can read called Sexier Than a Squirrel. And what it's saying is that you, the, the owner, you, the dog trainer, have to make yourself sexier, more appealing than whatever squirrel the dog wants to go and chase. And that's how you end up with an obedient dog. Well, we haven't managed it yet, but we're working on it. Um, but that's what, we need. that's what we need to do. We need to see that God is offering us something so much better than this other rubbish that we've grabbed hold of so that we drop that and, and run to him. C.S. Lewis uh, is a Christian writer. He wrote the Narnia stories for kids. You might know them. Uh, and here's, here's what he said about it. Our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. I just want to give three examples of what that might look like for us in our lives. There are lots of things that we chase after instead of God. Lots of places we go to find something good that we think might be better instead of coming to God who actually is better. Here's one, love. Now, love is a good gift from God. To fall in love is something that we were, we were designed to be able to do. But, but we sort of want it to be more than that. We want that person to be a soulmate. We want for someone to complete us, someone to make us whole. Now, that is something only Jesus can do. Only a relationship with God can give us that. If we don't, so people feel like that. I, I'm spending my life searching for that sense of being one and being whole and that wonderful romantic bliss 
that you see in some of the romantic movies. Uh, and people can feel very depressed that they haven't found that in their lives. And they can think, well, I'm single, and how can I ever have a kind of fulfilled whole content life if I'm single? And they just get very down about being single. Uh, and it's a huge pressure. But then if you actually are in a relationship, then it, that kind of thinking puts a huge pressure on that relationship. It makes it very difficult to enjoy what you have because you're imagining it should be something that actually isn't very realistic. It doesn't really happen between normal human beings in, in, in this world. It might happen on movies, but it doesn't often happen in real life. It might happen for a bit, it might happen for a few moments. Um, but real romantic relationships and real love have to deal with sleepless nights and kids getting up in the night and feeling sick and running out of money and being worried about, about, about that kind of thing. It's not all going to be candlelit dinners and gazing into each other's eyes. There's a little rhyme uh, that says, the eyes that over coffee look so very sweet don't look so appealing over shredded wheat. <laughs> there was a book written a while ago called uh, Britain on the Couch. Oliver James was the author, uh, and he said this. Uh, it's a secular book. It's not a Christian book. He said this. Today, we demand vastly more from our relationships like addicts searching for the fix of intensity and intimacy. But ironically, it's the broken bonds of love that are the greatest single cause of despair. So, nothing wrong with, getting, with being in love, getting romantic, good gift from God, but we want it to be more than it is, instead of realizing that what we're really looking for is Jesus. And that makes us miserable, and that damages relationships if we do have them. What a joy then to give that up, like the man who found the treasure in the field to say, um, praise the Lord, I'm free from that finally. And now I can focus on, on knowing God. Love, that's one example. Money would be another example. Um, we chase after possessions and wealth because we think that that is going to offer us more than it can. Um, apparently in 1883, someone called James Buchanan Duke bought two machines to make cigarettes. And it turned out that the number of cigarettes that he could make in, in one day was more cigarettes than anyone was buying in the whole of the United States. So he thought, oh, okay, well, how am I going to keep making money out of selling cigarettes now? I, I can't sort of, you know, just keep producing more and more cigarettes that no one wants. I'm going to have to convince people to want them. And so he, like a lot of other companies about the same time, started this whole kind of advertising thing that we're all living with today, where companies are not only trying to sell us things that we knew we wanted, they're trying to convince us that we want all kinds of things that we probably would have been fine without. And so we're all constantly bombarded with that on our phones all the time. Uh, we need stuff. We want stuff. You've got to work really hard to earn the money to buy all this stuff. And then you've got to work really hard to kind of look after this stuff and keep it clean and fix it when it's broken. And then you can't fit all the stuff in your house. So you've got to work really hard to try and get a bigger house. Um, and you've got more and more clutter. And you're trying to think, what am I going to do with this stuff I haven't used for ages? Maybe I could. Whenever you're thinking that, how can I put this stuff to good use? Don't want to stick it in the bin. Take it to a charity shop. What you're discovering is you shouldn't have bought it. And you shouldn't have spent that time earning that money that you spent to buy it. You could have done something better. with. But we all do that. That's how we live. That's how the Western world um, works now. And interestingly, in the Western world, people are getting richer and richer and richer. But when people do surveys to find out which countries in the world are happiest, it's not the rich people in the West that are happy. We, we score pretty low on those surveys. People are searching for wealth and fulfillment and having a job that gives you status and getting less and less happy. And that materialism, that greed that is just so normal and instinctive for, for our culture, for our society. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be free of that. What a joy to be free of that, that trap that we're burdened by and slaving after and to discover instead the kingdom of God. That's, that's the second example. Love, money. Third example, sex. Now, I'm conscious with this one. It's a bit of a sensitive subject. I don't know you. I don't know your situations. Please don't. I hope you won't feel I'm getting at you. If, if I am, it's completely by accident because uh, I don't know what's going on in your lives. But I'm guessing most of you know sex is actually a really good gift from God. Again, it's a wonderful thing that God designed and gave us and intended, and there's a whole part of the Bible, a whole book of the Bible that celebrates that. It's a song, a love song, some of it quite sort of explicit about what a good thing sex is. But it is designed for a purpose. It is designed to bring together a man and a woman in, in marriage, 
It is, it is when you think about it, uh, when some, where two people have sex, they're saying, look, I'm sharing everything with you. I'm not hiding anything anymore. This is complete intimacy, not holding anything back. I'm, I'm all yours, and you're all mine, which is very much the same as what people, two people say when they're getting married. They make a, a lifelong commitment to share their lives and share their bodies and become one, one body, one person. And that's kind of the meaning of sex, but um, often we are, or I guess all of us, tempted to, to see it as more of a short-term thrill and to take the commitment and the relationship and the intimacy um, out of it. And either we do that by having a series of different relationships with different people without ever quite committing um, to sharing our lives with them, and we let our feelings get involved in that, which they should be, because it's meant to be something that involves our feelings. Uh, and then we face a lot of hurt and pain when those relationships don't last. Um, and it's very disappointing. The other way that we can do it is we can say, well, I don't want to face that hurt and pain of the breakup, so, uh, but I do want the sex, so I'm going to switch off my feelings. And I'm turn sex into something that's just casual. Um, and really then it's become something very fake. It's become a fantasy. You're kind of pretending to be intimate with someone and pretending. Uh, particularly when people get into pornography and the whole thing is, is, has been sort of staged uh, in order to kind of fool you into thinking that you're having that kind of sexual relationship when really you, you're just looking at a screen and people on the other side of it are probably suffering in some way to have to produce that, that stuff. And it becomes something very cheap and hollow and empty um, and what we're doing is we're choosing a moment of fleeting pleasure that's quickly gone over the, the lasting reality of knowing God. Because actually sex is, is designed not only to bring a couple together in marriage, but to be a picture of our relationship with God. In the Bible, there's that theme that God loves his people and that oneness that to, uh, a man and a woman experience in, their, in a lifelong commitment is very much a picture of the oneness we are offered with God through Jesus Christ that we'll enjoy for all eternity. And it's a joy then to, to get rid of that way of life and to put it behind us and to receive God's forgiveness and to say, what I really want now is to know God. Well, those are just three examples. There's lots more. And I just want to finish by briefly saying, okay, well, how do we, how do we change? How do we actually put that into practice? How do we get ourselves to really desire God in such a way that we um, push out the desire for things that aren't, aren't good and aren't right. And um, there's, well, two things. We need to weaken that desire for sin, and we need to strengthen that desire for God. So what could you do? What steps could you take to weaken the desire for sin that there is in your life? What are the things in your life that reinforce that wrong desire and that particular temptation? For some people, it's drinking too much that is the problem. Um, and I know people who've decided they won't go to a pub. I mean, it's, there's nothing morally wrong with going to a pub. Christians can go to pubs. But just for some people, they might decide, hang on, I can't really manage it. I, I go to a pub and I end up drinking too much and doing and saying things that I regret later. Um, so just for me, you know, other people go to the pub. But I'm, I'm not. I'll go to a coffee shop. I'll do something else. I'm not going to go to a pub. Um, I've got a Christian friend who, before he came, became a Christian, used to go to nightclubs a lot and uh, pick up girls and take them home. And he decided that he just wouldn't go to a, a nightclub. Again, it's not morally wrong to go to a nightclub. You know, dancing, music, God invented them. Uh, perfectly possible to go to a nightclub and not do anything sinful while you're there. But for him, it was a trigger. This, was, this had been his habit. This had been his way of life. It was kind of, he'd, he'd trained himself, like I trained my dog. He'd trained himself to get into temptation when he was there. So he needed to go in, get out of that situation, at least for a while, and put himself in other situations. If shopping and spending, maybe, are for you too big a part of your life, you struggle to keep that under control, uh, and you, you, you think later, oh, I shouldn't have spent so much money, uh, what could you do? Could you cut some of the advertising out of your life? What does your phone do to you? What temptations does your phone present to you day by day? Is there something you could do about that? I know some people who've actually gone for a more basic phone that can't uh, appeal to them, or just have a setting on it so that it's mostly in black and white. It's amazing how things are just much less interesting when they're in black and white. Spend a lot less time looking at your phone when it's in black and white than, than when it's in color. What little steps can you take to kind of cut out 
some of those triggers and temptations in your life. For a lot of people, uh, men especially, pornography is a problem. I really recommend getting accountability software. There's, there's a, a few that are available. I think one of them's called Ever Accountable, another one's called Covenant Eyes. There are others too. You just download them onto your phone. Um, of course, the big thing you need is you need to have told someone, like I said yesterday, uh, share, um, share everything with someone, uh, share something. No, I'm getting the wrong way around. What did I say? Anyway, you don't need to tell everyone is what I'm saying, but you do need to tell someone. Um, it, it, I don't think really people can overcome pornography on their own if no one else in their life knows about it. Um, you don't need to tell the world, but you just need to find someone you can trust and, and have a word with them. And, and then the way these accountability software works is you, that person agrees to get uh, screenshots of, at random of what's on your phone. And, you, and then the fact that you know that that is happening just takes away the secrecy and the privacy and just makes it much easier to use your phone or your laptop uh, for, for things that are okay and not for things that are not okay. Teenagers might ask, you know, how far can I go in a relationship? I've got a girlfriend, I've got a boyfriend. How far can I go? Um, or you might think, well, I'm going to the pub. How many drinks are okay before I stop? And the Bible just says, look at it in a slightly different way from that. Not how close can I get to the edge of temptation, but how far away could I get from temptation? Can I flee from temptation? If that's an issue for you, weaken the desire for sin. The other things that we can do are to strengthen our desire for God. And I think a lot of Christians know that it's a really good idea to pray and read the Bible each morning. But sometimes for some of us, it can be a bit of a, a ritual, a duty. Oh, I've got to do this. You know, I probably won't have a very good day if I don't do this. I don't really want to do it, but I've got to do it. And, and see if you can turn those times into times when you, you come to meet with God. You know, ask God to help you with that. Say to yourself, this is just a few moments in my day when, when I'm going to meet with the living God, the wonderful good God. He's going to speak to me, searching the scriptures for something that feeds me and strengthens me, for some of that intimacy with God that he's created us to enjoy. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to meet with other Christians, isn't it? If the Holy Spirit is, in, in, is within us, then I can meet with God wherever I am on my own because the Holy Spirit's within me. But when I meet with a whole load of Christians and the Holy Spirit's within all of us, then that's a really intense experience of, of God and the Spirit, isn't it? So, so you don't want to miss that. You, know, you want to be there when the Christian family are meeting together and praying and praising and listening to God. So praising God with song is great. You know, we listen to... God's word and we understand it with our heads and sometimes when we're singing about it that's when our heart gets engaged and we sing those same truths and we feel what we believe and the Lord's Supper is another thing that God has given us to feed us spiritually uh, in the Church of England we talk about feeding, a, uh, feeding on Christ feeding our, in our hearts with thanksgiving um, spiritual food for us strengthening that gratitude and love for Jesus well let's taste and see that the Lord is God. Why don't we just take a, a moment or two in quiet um, and, in, in, and ask God, maybe in your own thoughts, to help us with, your, help us with our struggles, to, to give us that deeper sense of how good he is. Lord God, we praise you that you are good and we ask that you would help us to taste that goodness, help us to, to know you and love you and receive you. Forgive us when we look in all the wrong places for that contentment and wholeness and fulfillment that you give us. Help us to keep coming back to you and receiving more of you.
Thank you very much, Frank, uh, for that message and for the challenge it is to us all and also the encouragement. And um, yeah, we just, uh, as we continue to pray and ask God to help us, uh, that he will weaken our desire for sin and strengthen our desire for him, knowing his great goodness and that he is our living water. We're going to sing, Jesus is better. There is no other so sure and steady. My hope is held in your hand. When castles crumble and breath is fleeting, upon this rock I will stand. Upon this rock I will stand. thank you and praise you that you did make us for yourselves and we know our hearts are restless until they find rest in you so Lord I just pray that you will speak into all our hearts help us to be absolutely absolutely convinced that you are good and the living water that you offer 
is better than anything else that anything the world offers, no matter how bright and shiny it seems. Um, so, Lord, I just pray you give us all time to reflect and time to deepen our relationships with you and that we will daily seek to, to come to you and um, be filled with that living water. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Julie. Um, just a couple of things. Um, we've got about 45 minutes now until, uh, until the next session. Um, so uh, wonderfully, actually, we're not in a real rush to leave the site. The site said, you know, uh, as long as we're kind of clear, w there is no rush uh, for us to leave. So actually, kind of the most important thing really is uh, if there's a conversation that you want to have with somebody, if you want to go for a walk or pray or, or just kind of um, sit and reflect, then that is absolutely fine in the next um, sort of 45 minutes. And uh, please make the most of that. Um, if you could, if you have got time to, um, to clear your rooms, um, sort of the bed sheet, I think, that you've slept on, they've asked that we bring that down and we put that um, in reception and to take the, uh, the bin um, with the bin liner out and, and put that in a black bin outside. That would be lovely. Uh, but we've got tea and coffee served um, and um, clear your rooms if you can, but also just take the time. Uh, we've got the bookstall. Um, we've got the books. Um, do grab a book. Um, there's no payment method, so just kind of write your name down and then pay at the St. Simon's bookstall um, next week. Um, parents, uh, when you get your kids uh, ready for the next session at 11 o'clock, um, Michael and Megan have asked, um, could they be dressed in outdoor uh, gear, so shoes and a coat? Um, I, don't th I don't think it's raining, so I think they're just going to go outside and get, uh, burn off a bit of energy. And, and the last thing, a real encouragement actually for us. Um, uh, I thought it would be good to share with you. So, so Grace, um, the caterer, um, she's thanked Laura and she's thanked me. She says, um, your church has been a real blessing. Um, to them as a couple um, over, the, over the weekend. They said, they're, they're, for various reasons, that they've had a hard time. And she says, but your church has been super helpful. Um, we've never got away so early. Um, we've had loads of encouraging conversations with people. So she says that you, we have been a, a blessing to her as much as they've been a blessing to us. And so that's a real encouragement, isn't it, um, uh, to take. Um, but uh, tea and coffee um, served um, in the dining room now. Let's go.
is south facing windows. A new way to imagine your space. LG Wash Tower.
Wix gives you the freedom to tell your story with a professional website that reflects who you are and what you have to offer. Customize every element of your website to meet your needs and achieve your goals. Create a unique visual experience that enhances your product and amplifies your message. Expand your website with content that pushes your business forward. Share content that matters to your audience. And present it the way you envision it. From the biggest ideas to the smallest details. Your website, your voice, your platform.